Well, good morning. Good morning. We are going to go ahead and, and jump in. This is week nine, nine of this class. Uh, I've lost, lost count of the weeks. Uh, if you want to take your Bible and go to Revelation chapter 20, that's where we're going to look some today. I've given you a, a handout that is sort of the briefest, roughest depictions of these, these four views that we're going to talk about today. Those, uh, those graphics are, I, I believe, I, I pulled those years ago, but I believe they were, uh, if you have an ESV study Bible, I, I believe in the back, this is the, the sort of four, I've added a couple things to it for clarification, uh, the four sort of simple views uh, uh, summarized there. Just know, as we walk through today, these four views of the millennial reign of Christ and sort of the timeline, that what we're doing here is like if somebody asks you, how does a car work? And you like, you, you drew a box. And you're like, there, that's how a car works. Like, like there's some representation, but there is so much more to say and so much more than uh, can be said uh, in this class. I'm trying to give you at least an introduction to these views. I'm, I'm not particularly interested in trying to argue for or against any of the views. I just want to say here, here are the ones that, that are out there. Um, the four views that I'll talk about today, uh, as we, we think about the millennial reign of Christ, the difference of these is not liberal conservative or faithful or unfaithful or uh, takes the Bible seriously and doesn't take the Bible seriously or loves Jesus or doesn't love Jesus. Uh, the difference is just the difference of interpretation of particular passages, that these are orthodox views of the end times. Again, uh, most people are going to land in one spot or another. Uh, they have, all of these views have strong points. All of these views have places where they, they are still some questions. If anybody tells you that their view of the end times comes with absolutely no questions, well, then they've missed a couple things, right? All of these have some weaknesses. All of these have some areas where uh, there are some more difficult passages to try to interpret and put together. Uh, they're all using the same passages. They're all looking at the same text. They all believe the Bible is the word of God. They all believe in the return of Jesus. But they, the way they place those passages together, the way they understand uh, what is being said in those and the way they fit together, they they're simply just, just come to different conclusions. We'll, we'll talk a little bit as we get into it. Uh, that There's a lot of things that they have in common. Uh, obviously, some of the timeline is going to be different, but there's, they share a lot in common. Uh, and so if you fall into one or the other, this is, again, this is not faithful or unfaithful. These are all faithful ways to interpret and to think about the, the end times uh, and, and the millennial reign of, of Jesus. Uh, let, me, uh, let me pray for us, uh, and then, well, actually, let, let's, read, uh, let's read Revelation chapter 20. It's where we, we get this language that speaks of a thousand-year reign of Christ. Uh, let's read this, and then I'll pray for us, uh, and we'll ask for the Lord's help, and then we'll, we'll jump right in. Revelation chapter 20, verse 1. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent who was the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him, so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be released for a little while. Then I saw thrones, and seated on them were those to whom authority to judge was committed. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image, and had not received its mark on their foreheads or on their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. And when the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his, from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea. And they marched up over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Then I saw a great white throne of him who was seated on it. From, him, his pre from his presence, earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. 
Then another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged by what is written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Let's, uh, let's pray together. Uh, Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that... It's true, and we ask for help to understand it. We, we pray that even as we think today about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, that we would uh, do so not just with humility, but with great anticipation. That as we think about the return of Christ, it might grow in us a longing to see him and to be with him. Uh, Father, we thank you for these promises that though uh, sometimes it is hard for us to understand exactly what it is you're doing and are going to do, that we understand that uh, any trouble of understanding is on our side, not on yours, and that, that your plans are good and right and righteous, and uh, our hope in you is sure, for you do keep your promises. Uh, Father, we, th we thank you for uh, the grace and the mercy that you have shown us in the Lord Jesus Christ, and we, we look forward to the day in which we will uh, see him face to face. And we pray that you would use this, this time together uh, to grow that longing in our hearts. It's in the name of your Son we pray. Amen. So as we, we think about these four sort of timelines of, of the return of Jesus, they are the, the four ones we're going to look at. Really, it's three, three big categories, and then one of those is, is broken up into sort of two main streams, and then even within those streams, there are uh, countless sort of variations uh, that they are uh, named according to how they, generally how they view the return of Jesus uh, in relation to this thousand-year reign of Jesus that is spoken of in, in Revelation chapter 20. So uh, the first two we'll look at are called premillennial. So they believe the return of Jesus happens pre, that is before the millennial, the, the thousand-year reign of Christ. That's what that means. So we'll, on the back page, when we get there, we'll talk about post-millennial. Those, those are those who believe that the return of Jesus is going to happen post that reign of Jesus. And then we'll talk about what they mean by reign of Christ. How do they view the millennium? Uh, and then there is the, the fourth view, which is all millennialism. Uh, most all millennialists don't like to be called all millennialists because to put that prefix ah on the front means no millennium. And they would say, well, that's not fair. We don't believe that there is no millennium. We, we believe something different about what the millennium is. Uh, and so uh, they, they sometimes call themselves other things, but that's historically what they've been called. But they're not saying they don't believe in any millennium. They're, they're saying they believe that it's, it's different. We'll, we'll talk about what that uh, is when we get there. So they're, they're named by how they viewed the return of Jesus in relationship to whatever this is in Revelation chapter 20, this thousand-year reign of, of Jesus, this millennium uh, of Christ. We're going to see a few things as, as we work through these. Uh, one, they all deal with where does Jesus, the return of Jesus happen in relationship to this reign. Uh, exactly what is the nature of this thousand years? Uh, is it, uh, the question that they're all going to have to answer to some degree or another is, is it a literal thousand years? Or is it a symbolic number uh, that is symbolic for maybe just a really long period, but, or is it a literal thousand years? Is this uh, a literal physical reign on the earth? Or is this a different type of reign? Is this a, a reign on heaven, in heaven? Is this a spiritual reign? Is this, is this a literal kingdom for a literal thousand years on earth? Or is it some other type of kingdom, some other type of reign, uh, is, is that not happening physically on this earth? Uh, again, they're all going to answer those, those questions differently. Uh, they have to answer the questions of, of what we've seen in here. What does it mean that Satan is bound? What does that entail? If Satan is bound, what, can, what is the church doing? And so they're, they're all going to come to different conclusions. Again, they're all working with the same text. There's only one Revelation chapter 20. They're all dealing with the same symbols. They're all dealing with the, the same totality of Revelation as well as the other apocalyptic literature throughout the Bible, 1 Thessalonians, 1 Corinthians 15, what, what, Matthew 25, Old Testament text, Ezekiel and others, they're all dealing with the same, the, the same text, the, the same raw data, and they're, they're just simply putting it together uh, in, in different ways. Uh, you'll notice this is the timeline uh, that in some sense this is what everybody agrees on. And this may not look like much, uh, but in fact, this is quite a bit, right? So if we, if we were to, we could, we could probably add this here, and we'll fill this in in a bit. Uh, all four of these views, remember, they're orthodox views. They all believe Jesus was crucified, dead, and buried, that salvation comes through Christ and Christ alone, 
right? They believe in the, uh, the resurrection of Jesus. They believe in the, in the return of Jesus, right? That Jesus is going to come back. And that at the end of all things is this eternal state in which the people of God are with the Lord forever, right? That, that, so in some sense, how we get from here to there is it's great to think about. Uh, but everybody agrees we get there. Everybody agrees we've been saved by Jesus, Jesus is coming back, and we will be with Jesus for all eternity. The disagreement is how do we actually work out the timelines? Uh, and maybe this will encourage you, maybe it'll make you sad. Uh, we have been having this, church, this fight in church history from the very beginning. Uh, we've got nasty letters within like the first couple centuries of the church of guys making fun of one another. One early church father says of another that he's got no, like basically no sense about him uh, because he holds to a particular view of the end times. So people have been fighting about this for a long time. Uh, I don't think it's a thing worth fighting over. Uh, in, in fact, I, I don't think this is the sort of thing that in the body that we have to all agree on. Uh, that this is the sort of thing that you can see differently and still happily be in the same church body uh, and, and have no problem. So when we, we sort of think about theological triage, uh, that there are some issues that if we, we don't hold to these things, we're not Christian, right? That if these things that are at the core of what it means to be a believer, that if, if you deny those things, you're, you are not a believer. And then outside of that are issues that uh, Christians can disagree over, but it makes it really hard to be in the same body together. So uh, one of the, the easiest ones to think about is, is our view of baptism. So we are Baptists. We believe in a, a, a believer's baptism, and a, a, baptiz- a baptism that is only for those who have confessed their sins and expressed repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. There are other fine brothers and sisters who I count as brothers and sisters in the Lord who hold to pedo baptism, or that is the baptism of infants. Right? I don't think they're not believers, but it's going to get really hard to be in the same body together because babies are going to be born, and we've got to decide what to do with them. Right, so that it gets, it's not that we are not saying we're not Christians, but it gets hard to, to be in the same individual body together. And then you have things that are outside sort of in that third tier that individual believers can disagree on and happily still be in the same body together, that it should cause no problem in, the, in an individual body. I think this is where the timeline of eschatology should fit, uh, that it should be in this third tier of which uh, as long as we are orthodox, right, we're believing the main things, that we might see these things differently and be able to happily coexist together in, in the same body. This is not the sort of thing that we should split over. Uh, this is not the sort of thing that should tear churches apart. It's that, that we, again, we agree on the big pieces. Jesus came and died, was resurrected, Jesus is coming back, and we're going to be with Jesus until the end, uh, uh, for the end of, uh, of the rest of eternity. Uh, and so if within the body, these are things that we can, we can disagree over. So you may land on one of these four, uh, or you may look at this and say, I don't, I don't, know, I don't like any of these. Uh, and you, you know, I should have given you a blank sheet, and you can uh, read the text and make your own, and you can figure out how you think it fits together. Uh, the truth is, at the end of the day, we can still happily be together in the same body uh, because we agree on a lot of things, uh, and this is not the sort of things that we should, we should divide over. So let's, let's look at the first two uh, that really fall under one larger umbrella. And again, there are different stripes and variations of both of these. Um, the first you'll see there is, is called classic premillennialism. Uh, sometimes you'll see it represented or called historic premillennialism. Uh, it is uh, seen uh, to some degree throughout church history in different places and different, uh, in different stripes of, of theological traditions. Uh, you see this some in, in the Reformers uh, and, and other stripes throughout church history. Uh, it, it is a, a belief that it's premillennial, so that the return of Jesus is going to happen before the millennium, uh, but most classic premillennialists would hold that it is going to come after the tribulation. So uh, you've got that, that, that chart there. So classic premillennial view holds Jesus has been raised, that we are in this age right now. So this is where we are now. We are in this church age. And that at some point, yet in the future, there will come a time of great tribulation. And again, folks disagree on exactly how we'll see that and when that's going to happen. But that that it's part of this church age that there'll be a a time of, of tribulation in which believers will experience suffering. They'll experience martyrdom. They'll experience suffering for their faith. 
Um, it is, I think, useful to note, both here and as we talk to the others, uh, that they all believe Revelation, that, that uh, believers are not going to experience the wrath of God, uh, that, there is a, that there is a suffering that they'll experience for their faith, but God is not pouring out his, his judgment on them. Uh, and so there is, a, there is a tribulation here towards the end. Uh, the, the big piece is, is that here, when thinking about the return of Jesus, is that they see this return of Jesus, you think of, uh, of uh, what we see in 1 Thessalonians 4, uh, and this resurrection of believers as one big public event, that the return of Jesus will be, it will be public and visible. And so we, we talked about this, Stan, a little bit, a little bit last week, uh, that they would, they would see that Jesus is going to, Jesus is going to come, Believers will be caught up into the air with him. And then we'll, we'll immediately follow him back to the earth, right? That this is, that this is immediate. Now, they would say uh, from 1 Thessalonians 4 that uh, the, the word, they're caught up to meet him in the air. They would say in both in other places in the New Testament. And that word can be used and is used in some places to, to give the image of coming out and meeting someone and, and escorting them back in. So when Jesus tells the parable of the, bride, uh, the, the bridemaids, uh, they, what do they do? They go out, they meet the groom, and they escort him to his bride. Uh, that, so they would say that's the image here, is that we're called up to meet him in the air, and then we are, we are coming back down with him. There is a, uh, there is a resurrection here of, of believers. So they would, most of them would say that this, this what Paul describes, this resurrection of believers, in, in 1 Corinthians 15 happens here as well, uh, that it's, it's all sort of one big event. So uh, we, we talked last week, Stan, about a rapture. Everybody, they, all four of these hold to some version of a rapture. Um, it's just what do, they, what do they think that is? For, for classic premillennials, it's, there is an immediate return, right? That we are coming up with, with coming to meet Christ, coming back down, that at this return, that Satan is bound, right? What, what we just read in, in Revelation 20, this binding of Satan happens. Uh, and then I, I've got it there uh, on your thing. Classic premillennialists disagree over when they think this, this great battle is, is going to happen. Um, some, some would put Armageddon right here. Uh, I, I think probably now most place it at the end. But, so what, what this says is that this is, Jesus is going to come, and it's going to bring in this thousand-year reign of Christ. Many of, these would, many of these would hold that this is a literal thousand years, and it is physically happening on the earth. Now, some would say that this is a physical reign, uh, but maybe not a thousand years. Maybe it's longer, maybe it's shorter, but it's the, the image is of a long time period uh, but most classic pre premillennialists would still hold to this is a literal physical reign on the earth. The resurrected Jesus is on the earth. He is with his people, that he is, those that he has given resurrected bodies, and they have this thousand-year reign on the earth. Uh, again, I, I think if in this, in this framework, Armageddon probably fits better here towards the end uh, when Satan is loosed. There is a final rebellion and a final battle, uh, and then ultimately a final judgment at the end of that, which, let me see if I can draw the, that's a judgment seat, by the way, if that's why, the, that's why it looks like a chair, right, that there's a final judgment there that then ush ushers in, uh, ushers in the, the final, uh, the final state of, of all things. So this is a, a classic premillennial view. We're in the church age now, at some point, tribulation and trouble is going to come, that the church is going to endure that, uh, that, that God will protect them. God's not pouring out his wrath on them, but, but God will help them to endure in that, even though they'll be martyred, that there is going to be a public visible coming of Jesus, the resurrection of the saints. Those are, in, in a sense, one united event that they're happening together, that they'll be called up to meet the Lord in the air, usher him back down to begin a physical reign of Jesus on the earth uh, for a thousand years. Uh, again, most of them would hold that is a, that is a literal thousand-year reign. Uh, and that in that, Satan is bound uh, and then is loosed at the end of that. And then a, a final battle, a putting away of sin, death, and hell once and for all. This final judgment seat. 
Uh, most w- would hold probably that that's where the resurrection of unbelievers comes. Uh, is, is there at the end, I think I've got that noted, uh, there at the end on this final judgment that there is a resurrection coming for everybody, right? some to life and some to death, and so there's going to be this final resurrection, some to, to go into death, some to go in, into life. Uh, most would hold that happens there uh, at that, that final judgment seat, entering into the eternal state uh, of, of all things. But So the big pieces, the return of Jesus, it's public visible, before the reign of Christ, thousand-year reign of Jesus, physically on the earth, a millennial of Christ reigning with and over his people uh, and over the earth. Uh, now, you, 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 both this, this, this one and uh, both uh, uh, the next one we'll talk about, dispensational uh, pre-trib pre- premillennialism, often called dispensational premillennial, premillennialism, um, they have to answer the question, and they have answers for it, how do unbelievers get into this millennial reign of Jesus? How do you have Who's Satan deceiving at the end when he's let loose? How do, you have, how do you have a battle of Armageddon? Which, again, this is why it leads some premillennialists to move the battle up here. Uh, because you have to answer the question, well, how do you have unbelievers in this millennium, in this reign of Jesus? How do, you, how do the unbelievers get there? They have answers for that, uh, of, of thinking through how, how does that happen. They, they have different answers depending on who you ask. Uh, but there are, that's not like a, a question that is not, uh, not able to be over, overcame. Uh, post-millennialists and amillennialists, well, what's one of the things they'll say is, how, how do you have unbelievers here? This is the reign of Jesus. Who, who, is, who are we fighting? Who's Jesus overcoming at the end of this reign? How, how do they get in? How, how are they there? Uh, again, they have, they have answers to that. So this is a, a basic sort of timeline. Let's, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump in to the next one, and we'll, we'll, uh, adjust this, uh, we'll adjust this a little bit. So the, the next one, Really, I, I don't think it's fair to say, people will say, well, this was invented in England uh, by John Nelson Darby. I don't think that's fair. To, I don't think that's a fair representation. I don't think that's fair to say. Uh, I think we, it, it finds prominence there, and, and probably maybe it's most uh, effective person to articulate that, that view uh, in John, John Nelson Darby uh, in the 19th century, and then it... it, it uh, finds popularity and is spread through things like the Schofield Bible. Uh, but I, I don't think it's fair to say John Nelson Darby invented this. I, I think probably elements of this, and to a, to a degree, existed long before John Nelson Darby. Uh, but it is a, a pre-tribulational, really a, a dispensational. Understanding that is a, a tweak of what, what, we've just, uh, what we've just mentioned. So... Part of what we, we've got to say is that, is that when we think about this view, it is part of a larger theological framework that goes far beyond end times uh, understandings, uh, a larger theological framework called dispensationalism, uh, which again is an orthodox one. It's not, it's not, again, it's not a difference between faithful or unfaithful. Um, modern day folks who, who you might know as dispensationalists, John MacArthur is a, is a dispensationalist. Uh, most of your if you see the end times depicted in popular sort of literature or movies, uh, the Left Behind series, most of those are going to just sort of naturally, by default, come from a dispensational understanding. Um, there's a lot more we could say about the difference between dispensational and other sort of theological frameworks. Uh, maybe the, the biggest, for, for our purposes here, uh, maybe the biggest thing we, we can say is that from a dispensational framework, that largely... Again, there are a million stripes, so uh, if I describe the wrong stripe that you're not a part of, show me grace. Largely, they would say that there is a distinction and a difference in the way the Lord deals with ethnic Israel and the way the Lord deals with Gentile church. And that that distinction is, in some sense, eternal. That it is a, it is a perpetual distinction. Uh, that there are, uh, again, I think it's fair to say that most dispensations will, would hold to some version, regardless of what, what they might call it, of, of a two, peop, two peoples of God. There, there is Israel, and then there is the church, and there is, in some sense, a uniting of those at the end of all things, but there is still a distinction between ethnic Israel and the nations, ethnic Israel and the, the Gentile church, uh, that they would see uh, there a theological distinction be- between the two. Uh, and so they would say that the promises of God will come to the fulfillment they will be fulfilled, but they will not be fulfilled for everybody in Christ 
in the same way or to the same degree, uh, and that some promises will only come to ethnic Israel, uh, some promises will only come to the Jews, and that the church can have, will have some of those to a degree, but not in the same way or not to the same degree, uh, that there is a, dis- a distinction between ethnic Israel and the church. Uh, again, not a difference of, of faithful or unfaithful. I'm not a dispensationalist, but I, I, I appreciate and, and uh, can learn from lots of folks who are dispensationalists. Again, I, I don't, that's not the framework in which I come to the scriptures. I, I see Jesus as the fulfillment of Old Testament Israel, that Jesus is the fulfillment of all the promises of the Old Testament, and that there is one people of God, there is one vine, uh, and that those that are in Christ are in Israel. Uh, but again, that's the way I, that's the framework I, I come from, it's what I learned, it's what I learned from Dr. York, it's what I learned from before Dr. York. Uh, this, but this is, uh, this is the framework, so when we come to this timeline, understand that's a larger framework that creates a distinction between Jews, ethnic Israel, and, and the Gentile church. So in this, we'll, we'll shift this timeline some. So again, they would still hold Jesus crucified, dead, buried, raised. In some sense, what God is doing now, so this is still the age we're in, the church age. In some sense, what God is doing now is, is almost like a parenthesis from his, what he's doing with Israel. It's that in the Old Testament, he dealt with Israel. Israel rejects him. And so that God offers now the gospel through Christ to the Gentiles, to the nations in this age. But then this age is going to come to a close. This is sort of a parenthesis in God's plan. And that this age is going to come to a close and God is going to return back to his original plan. God is going to go back to uh, the, the plan of, of, old, of the Old Testament. And so the, the church age, those, who, those of us, unless you're here and you're ethnically Jewish... Uh, that, that we are a part of this sort of parentheses. We're a part of this church age of what God is doing among the nations, among the Gentiles, bringing them in now, uh, but that he is going to return back to this original plan uh, from the Old Testament, this original plan to deal, with, to deal with Israel. So they too would hold to a rapture. One of the differences here is that they would hold that this return of Jesus that happens at the rapture, where classic premillennial would say that's a public one. It, it's trumpets and shouting. They would say that this is a, a, a secret or, or sometimes called invisible rapture, uh, that this is the left behind. This is the, the when you think of the image of the rapture of uh, those, everybody who belongs to the Lord has disappeared. Uh, no one knows. No, they didn't see Jesus. There wasn't a, all that's left is the evidence that they're not there anymore, that they're, they're gone they would say this is a, a secret rapture. This is an invisible one. That it's not, it's not a, a declared public, a public visible viewing of Jesus. But rather it is Jesus simply removing. And who's he removing? He's removing the church. And, and basically all the saints in this New Testament age. Right? That, that, that they're being resurrected. That they're, they're, being, they're brought up to Jesus. Uh, and that they're, they are taken. Now, uh, everybody in the dispensational viewpoint, where if we, we go back to this, how long are we with Jesus? Do you remember in the premillennial, it was, a, it was immediate. In the dispensational one, most see that this, this would fulfill uh, Daniel's 70th week, that this would be a seven-year period. Now, we'll, we'll talk about it in a minute, uh, exactly where in this seven-year period does the rapture happen? Even within this framework, you have, uh, you have pre-trib, right, that, that happens at the very beginning. Uh, you have post-trib, some that say it happens at the end. You have somewhere mid-trib that happens at the three and a half year mark. And then you have a, a, what's called a pre-wrath one. It's that it happens somewhere in there, probably towards the end. But there is a distinction there between the tribulation of God's people and the wrath of God poured out on the world. And so they would say this rapture happens after the tribulation, but before the wrath. And so it, it, could, be, it could be here, it could be three and a half years, it could be four years, it could be somewhere in there. But there was, there's going to be a shift from tribulation to wrath and that the rapture will, uh, will happen there. Again, there are different stripes uh, of, of understanding of exactly where within that, where within that does it happen. Uh, the focus here... is back on Israel, back on ethnic Jews. 
back on the nation of the ethnocentric nation of Israel. Again, we, we've had the church age. That this, in, in some sense, is bringing a close to the church age, uh, and that uh, that there is then uh, a return of Israel. That there is a salvation of Israel that is happening in in this tribulation. Um, the the one stripe of this that that uh, I would say begins to push against the boundaries of what I would call or, orthodoxy. There are some there are some here who would say that Israel can be saved in this apart from Jesus. Uh, that, that, to me, pushes the boundaries of what I think can be held orthodoxy, uh, that, they would, that, some would, that they're going to be saved by works of the law, that they're going to be saved by uh, sacrifices. Uh, I, I, I don't think that's true. Uh, now, I don't hold to this whole viewpoint, but I, I, think that is, I think that's too far. That's not what most dispensationalists hold. They, they would still say that Jesus, we're saved by Christ, we're saved ultimately by the work of Jesus even if that is dispensed, in a sense, to Gentiles and to Jews differently, that it comes to us in, in different ways and in, with different promises, uh, most would still hold that. The ultimate, ultimate salvation still comes through Jesus and Jesus alone. Uh, and then at the end of this, then, is the ushering in of a, a literal thousand-year uh, thousand reign, uh, uh, thousand reign of, of Jesus. Uh, most would hold that there will be a, a rebuilding of the temple, There'll, there'll be a, a reinstitution of some version of the, the Old Testament sacrificial rites. Um, most don't hold that it's going to be a one-to-one correlation, but there'll be, there'll be some version of sacrificial rites that, some, that uh, in most of these systems, they would say the way that the Old Testament looked forward to the sacrifice of Jesus, that these sacrifices will in some ways uh, maybe serve ceremonial purposes, cleansing purposes, but, but they, will, they will look back at the sacrifice of Jesus, that they will happen in a literal temple in Jerusalem, uh, that the, this will be, uh, in some sense, this thousand-year reign is the Lord, Christ Jesus, reigning with resurrected Israel, reigning with him, and together reigning over the Gentile church, reigning over all the rest of the world. Uh, again, so the same thing, they, they would say there are unbelievers that survive this, uh, that, that uh, Armageddon comes comes here at the end of, at the end of this Satan Satan is loosed I can't even read that there's no way you can read that there, that Satan is loosed there at the end of that I forgot to tell you, he's he's bound here just just as in the the, the previous one uh, he's he's bound there at the beginning uh, and, and then is, is loosed Again, I think I've got Ar- Armageddon represented there. I think that's wrong. I don't think it should be there. Uh, I, I, think, I think most would say it's here. Uh, I, could, I could be wrong on that. I think most, most uh, dispensationalists would say Armageddon happens at the end of this reign, not at the beginning. So I think just on your, uh, on your handout there, that's, that's not accurate. So the biggest difference from the first sort of stripe of pre- premillennialism, both say Jesus returns before the, uh, the, the millennial reign. One is, in some sense, a twofold coming of Jesus. First, a first that is secret and invisible for the church. And then the second one that is public. Right? At the end of this tribulation, at the end of the, the wrath that is poured out, uh, at the end of those seven years, that is, that is public, that Jesus does then come uh, and, and usher in this thousand-year reign of, of Jesus. So that's one big difference. And then the second there is within that framework of the way they understand the distinction between the church and Israel, and that that distinction uh, not only persists, but persists throughout the millennial reign and into the, into the eternal state uh, to, to a degree. So these are the, if you're, just thinking, if you're just talking about church history for the last 2,000 years, where have most people probably fallen? Most people have fallen in, in these two big buckets. Uh, the, the first would be, uh, it, it's, I don't think it's, it's unfair to say that a classic historic premillennial is by far, you see that more in church history, uh, that, that it is the default, uh, probably until John Nelson Darby uh, and in, in the decades that follow him, uh, that in the last 150 years, this is probably the more dominant view. Uh, if you came into this class not knowing what your viewpoint is, my guess is you probably are by default some version of dispensational it is um, in the last 150 years uh, kind of been the, the default the, especially in the western world uh, it, has, it has been uh, the, the majority view, viewpoint uh, they are these are two stripes the same thing premillennial uh, Jesus coming uh, coming before the millennial reign of Christ 
Uh, and again, even within this, you have uh, pre-trib, rapture, pre-tribulation, post-tribulation, mid-tribulation, pre-wrath rapture, of exactly when that rapture, uh, when that rapture uh, happens. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I think, yeah, I, I think, I think there is, again, I, you know, I, yeah, this is where, so, we're, we're the, uh, of the four that we'll talk about, post mill is the one I'm, I'm probably least convinced of, but even post mill, they, they have, they have, they have, they have, I don't think, convincing arguments from my perspective, because I'm not post mill, but I think they have reasonable arguments from the scriptures, um, this is, I mean, there, you can argue this from the scriptures. There's no, there's no question about that. Like, I, again, I, I think so somebody like MacArthur or other folks that are, that are dispensational in their framework, I don't think they're unfaithful. I mean, I think, uh, again, I don't think any of these are without some weak points, without some questions they have to answer. Okay, well, then ha if, that, if it happens that way, how do you deal with this text? All of them have that, uh, and all of them have answers. Of, okay, well, here's a difficult passage that, that fit within this framework. Here's, how the way we, here's the way we see that fit together. But yeah, this is... Yeah, you can absolutely defend this. You can absolutely defend this from the scriptures. No, no. All right, let's uh, let's let's keep rolling. The next that we'll we'll talk about is is uh, post mill. I'll erase this one. It is making some some bit of a, a, a comeback in, in the last probably 30 years, uh, and, and pr probably with I think some people misunderstand it, and so, I think some people um, say things about it that aren't true, and and speak about it in ways that I think are unfair. Uh, it, it is it is uh, we'll, we'll talk about it here in a second. So post mill, if we're we're talking about naming these by their relationship to the return of Jesus. If it's called post-millennialism, where do they put the return of Jesus in relationship to the millennium? It's after. Right? It is post. Uh, so again, they would hold, and this is an oversimplified, uh, oversimplified version, uh, they would hold to the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus, just like we would, just like anybody would, everybody would. On that, we are in this church age right now, uh, that, that we are the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, they would hold to, most post-millennial would hold to a one people of God, not a distinction between Israel and, and Gentiles. They would hold to, there's one vine, there's one people of God, and it's, it's, it's now all of the promises of God are in Christ, brought to the church, to, to his people, to those that are in Jesus, uh, that they're, they are in this church age, that at some point in this church age, at some point, as the gospel goes forth, an individual post millennialists will disagree on this at some point there is a there is a binding of satan at, at some point there is this uh, what we see in revelation chapter 20 uh in, in which not only is the gospel able to go forth but it, it is able to go forth exponentially that things are going to get uh, continually better and better and better that are in some sense going to usher in and lead to this thousand year reign of, of jesus so again i, I want to be fair I, I think some people have said things that are not true about post mill, and that I think they would they have said, well, the post millennialists believe that it's through government or that it's through politics or that it's through man's effort that ultimately it's through science or technology that we're going to be able to make the world better and better and better and better, and that ultimately usher in the return of Jesus, usher in this new millennial reign of, of Jesus. Uh, so again, in this they would they would put the return of Jesus, the actual physical present back here. Uh, I don't think that's fair, even with modern post-millennialists. Uh, that, uh, sure, are there, are there stripes that probably hold that, that the majority of this getting better in the world is going to come politically or through science or technology? Maybe. Uh, but I, I think most current day post-millennialists, and even the ones you see in history, would hold that the way the earth is going to get better is ultimately by the proclamation of the gospel, is that people are going to be saved, that it's that they are going to submit to the Lord Jesus Christ, that they're going to live lives uh, that are, are submitted to Jesus, that are in obedience of his word, uh, that they're, they're, that's going to transform churches and communities and nations, that there is going to be a, a that the church, is, the, church is going to, uh, the church is going to get better, that it's going to 
usher in this, this glorious sort of thousand-year reign, reign of, of Jesus. Uh, now, again, they, they disagree. Most of them, obviously, this differs from pre-mill and, and dispensational pre-mill, and that where is Jesus during this reign? Jesus is on the throne in heaven. That it is a, it is a literal reign on earth. There is a, a thousand years of peace, but, the, but Christ is reigning from heaven. Uh, and then at the end of that thousand years then is when we, we get the physical return of Jesus. Uh, Satan's loosed, Armageddon, uh, Armageddon happens, all that, all that happens back here. Very similar to the others, except that the return of Jesus, uh, the return of Jesus happens then. And, and so they would, they would hold, again, that it's through the preaching of the gospel, it's the people submitting to Jesus, that there, there is going to be a point and most of them don't hazard to guess when that point comes. Uh, and some would say we're, we may not even be sure when we cross into the beginning of that millennium. Uh, but that, that by the proclamation of the gospel, that the world is going to continue to improve as it submits to Jesus and will be transformed. And that we will have a thousand years of peace on earth uh, uh, as, as the world is submitted uh, to a reigning Christ who is crucified, risen, reigning from heaven, who is going to, is, who is going to, to, to come again. Uh, this, this was very popular uh, during the Industrial Revolution, sort of the end of the 18th, 19th, end of the 18th century, 19th century, uh, partly because of what was happening in the world. If you just think about uh, 1800s and 1900s, uh, and really into the 1700s, the, the advancements in human life in that time span was really unlike anything else we've seen in human history. Just the, the jumps we made in every area of life uh, and so it was easier for people to see that maybe the world is getting better. Maybe, maybe we are going to get more righteous. Maybe we are going to, maybe, it, maybe it is going to get better. Uh, and then ultimately it, this, this viewpoint takes a dip for a bit uh, as you come into uh, both World War I and World War II, in which much of the advancements that we'd had in the last 150 years leading into those wars were now used to kill each other. And so it Put a, it dampened a lot of people's view on uh, maybe we're not getting better. And maybe the ways in we think we're getting better, we're just getting better at killing each other. Uh, it, it is, both with, with all of these, it's, it is helpful to be able to look at church history sometimes and be able to see uh, that, that sometimes what's happening in history uh, help either makes a, a view more popular or less popular. And so post-World War I and World War II, this takes a dip. Uh, it is probably resurged to a degree uh, in the States, especially probably in the last... 40 years, 30, 40 years. Uh, again, the, the key here is that it's the, it's, it is Jesus that is bringing about this transformation in the world. Uh, it, is, it is not uh, uh, not primarily the mechanism of politics or other things. Now, it, I think it is fair to say that they would say that as, as the, the gospel is proclaimed and people are, submit to Jesus, that will have an effect on politics, that will have an effect on government, that will have an effect on everything we do, um, but that ultimately this progress is going to come not primarily through those things, but through Jesus, who might use means, who, who will use his people in every way, in every means, uh, to usher in this, this millennial reign, uh, this uh, millennial reign of Jesus, this, this thousand years uh, of them, uh, of Jesus reigning with us, Jesus coming then uh, at the end, ending all things. So again, what do we have? Unless there's supposed to be a J. Jesus crucified, dead, and buried, raised. Jesus coming back, and we're with Jesus all the way at the end. This is a this is a faithful Orthodox understanding of of uh, in the same way that I think you can make a a, a reasonable biblical argument for historic premillennial, premillennialism. I think you can make a reasonable biblical argument for a dispensational premillennialism. I think. This is the one I'm least convinced of, but I think you can make a reasonable biblical case for a post-millennial understanding uh, of, of the end times. I think there are people that do, uh, and it's, it is certainly within orthodoxy. Again, they're using the same text. They're just understanding the way they, they fit together uh, slightly differently. Okay, let's, let's talk about the last one. Talk about all millennialism. Uh, Again, all millennialists uh, sometimes like to be, at least the old term used to be gospel agers. Uh, they don't like to be called all millennialists because it makes it seem like they're saying there is 
no millennium. They didn't name themselves. Somebody else named, somebody who was not an all-millennialist named them because uh, they'd say, no, we do believe in a millennium. We do believe in the reign of Jesus. Uh, we don't believe it doesn't exist. We do believe it does exist, and we just believe it, it happens differently than, than the other four views. Uh, so what the, essentially the view says there is no future millennium, uh, that, that that reign is happening now, that it is in some sense symbolic, uh, uh, that the language is symbolic of the reign that Jesus has, uh, the reign that Jesus has now. So we'll erase this. So they too would begin with the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus that brings in the church age. Most of them would say that in that, that at the resurrection of Jesus, the death and resurrection of Jesus, that Satan is bound. Not that he is not able to do anything, but that, but that he is bound to the degree that the gospel can go forth. So their argument would say, well, Jesus tells his disciples to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. What has happened since then? Is the gospel's going to the ends of the earth. That it is spread across the, the globe. That, that the gospel is advancing. That people are both proclaiming the gospel and people are hearing the gospel and believing and being saved. That the gospel is spreading. And so they would say, yeah, Satan's not, not fully uh, done away with, but he is bound. He's He's hemmed into a degree that, that he is bound, and the proof of that and this viewpoint would be, well, the gospel's going forth. People are, are preaching the gospel. People, people are being saved. Uh, they, I don't, I don't think I had this in the other ones. Uh, they hold that at some point in here, that Israel, that, that uh, ethnic Israel, na national Israel will be converted. Uh, in the same way, if you, you go back to the, the front page, most, most historic premillennial, so if, if a dispensational viewpoint says that happens during that tribulation uh, that is in between, in that somewhere in that seven years. Uh, most classic historical premillennialists would say uh, that uh, what Paul describes in Romans 9, 10, 11 uh, happens somewhere before that return of Jesus. Uh, that, that at some point there will be a, a mass ingathering of ethnic Jews, of national Israel, uh, by faith in Jesus, that the Spirit will move in them, that they will... Uh, Paul says, and in that way, all Israel will be saved, that they'll come into faith. Again, there are some stripes who say that salvation happens apart from Christ. I, I think that's sub-Christian. I, I mean, I think that is uh, so disconnected from what the New Testament says. Uh, but that's not most dis dispensationalists. Most dispensationalists would say that, that Israel comes to faith in Christ as Messiah, that they, they would put their faith and trust in him, and that salvation comes in him, uh, comes through him. Uh, so in this view, they would say something similar, that somewhere in here, as the gospel goes forth, that there is this great ingathering of, uh, even of ethnic Israel, what Paul describes, that they're putting their faith in Jesus, they're, uh, they're, they're coming in. Uh, and then th this is, in some sense, this church age is the millennial reign of Christ. That it is heavenly, that Jesus is on his throne. So in that way, it's, it's similar to post-mill, that where is Jesus during his reign? He's in heaven. But it differs from post-mill in that where is the rain happening? They would say it's largely a spiritual rain, right? That it's, it's seen on the earth, but not in the same way that post-mills would say that it's seen on the earth. Uh, that, that it is largely a, a, a picture of his, his spiritual reign over all things as the gospel, as Jesus is reigning over his church and the gospel by the church is going forth uh, and taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. Uh, that, 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 that is the millennial reign. So again, they would say it's not fair to say we don't believe there is a reign. No, we, they would say, we think we're in it. We think we, right now we are in the millennial reign of Christ, that Jesus is risen, he's on the throne, he's reigning over his church, he has given us orders that we are taking the gospel to the ends of the earth, we're preaching the gospel, people are being saved, churches are being built, uh, that this is the reign of Jesus right now, uh, that, that he is working in and through us. And that at the end of this, whenever, whenever it is, I wrote satin is loose. I don't know what other fabrics will be at the end of all things. Satan's loose, right? There is this, this final rebellion. Most would put Armageddon there, that this, there's this final battle that happens. And in some sense, what you see, I'm going to move this, uh, move this judgment seat a little bit, is, is kind of a collapsing in this view of a lot of different events that in the other views, 
they sort of hold as separate events, uh, a placing of a lot of those events together. So uh, they would say the, the, the calling up into the air of 1 Thessalonians, 4, 1 Thessalonians 4, the resurrection of believers from 1 Corinthians 15, the resurrection of unbelievers, the judgment seat, the, the, the bringing down of the new heaven, new earth, they would say that all happens here. Right? There is one big return of Jesus, one big vis- visible return, Jesus coming for his people and raising some to life and some to death, bringing, ushering in this, this new heaven and new earth, right? He comes to fight this final battle. Uh, and they would say it all, it's, it's one big united event where in, in nearly all the other three that we looked at, those things are, are seen often as separate events. Uh, that they're not all happening together. The resurrection of believers happens here. The resurrection of unbelievers happens later. Uh, there are different judgments that uh, believers are rewarded before unbelievers are judged. So they would sort of collapse all of those events together in, in one big, uh, in one uh, large event uh, that it's all happening here at the return of Jesus at the judgment seat, uh, at the judgment seat of Christ. So one of the things that I, I uh, can appreciate, not an amillennialist, one of the things I can appreciate about them is their optimism uh, about what is happening now. That I, I, I though I, I don't, again, I'm not an amillennialist. Uh, I'm, there's no way I'm going to make it to the sermon. My tongue is so tied by the end of this. I can appreciate, in the same way that I can appreciate uh, pieces of, of post mill as well, the optimism of what is happening here and now. Uh, that the gospel is going forth. People are being saved. Uh, is the world uh, getting worse in a lot of ways? It seems like it is, right? Is, are, are there lots of terrible things in the world? Absolutely. But also, I'm encouraged that the gospel today is going to be preached in places that 200, 300 years ago, we maybe would have never dreamed it would be there. The gospel is taking root in places uh, that is a tremendous testimony to the work of God and to the work of the Spirit. Uh, that uh, per capita, the nation that sends the most missionaries in the world is not America, it's Korea. That we, we, the, the church is growing fastest in Iran and in China. Or that we, we see the gospel going forth in incredibly difficult places and in incredibly dark places and places where there is, they are at risk of martyrdom, where they are suffering, where they are being persecuted. And we're, we're seeing great gospel work there. So I can appreciate that they lean into the work that, that's happening now and they lean into the reign of Jesus. Is Jesus on the throne? Yeah, he is. I mean, I, you can't argue that piece from the New Testament. Jesus right now is seated on the throne. Now, does that necessarily mean that this is the millennial reign? No, that does, those two things aren't necessarily the same. But I, I can appreciate that they lean into, oh, Jesus is reigning on the throne. Jesus is king right now. A very similar idea in, in post-millennialism that Jesus is reigning. Jesus is king, that, that he is reigning right now. He's not, we're not having to wait one day for this other thing to come, but there is a, a reign now. Uh, so, again, all four of these are orthodox. They're, they're within the bounds of orthodoxy. Uh, they are uh, reasonable. You can make a biblical case for them. Uh, you can't hold all four, so uh, they, don't, they are mutually exclusive, right? You can't, they don't fit together. Uh, that's why they're different. Uh, and if you, if in sitting through this, if you say, you came in and you say, well, I've never heard of any of these four, uh, and I have no clue, I have no clue which one I am. I remember when I was in seminary, I, I uh, got out of Bible college. We never talked about end time stuff. Uh, and I got to seminary. And I didn't realize how much I missed in, in uh, my undergrad until I got to seminary. And my, I remember I was, it was my first class uh, in seminary, first day of my first class. Uh, and then we were going over the syllabus. And our, my professor was saying, you know, we're going to talk about these things at some point. And he said, I'm just curious, like, who's, who in here is all mill? And people raised their hand. Who's post mill? People raised their hand. Who's pre mill? Okay. Who's or who's historic pre mill? Who's who's dispensational pre mill? Okay. And I just remember sitting and waiting, like, okay, eventually he'll say a word I've heard before. And then, uh, like, he he, there were only a couple of us that didn't raise our hands. And like, I still praise the Lord to this day. He asked the other guy. He was like, well, you never raised your hand. Well, what are you? Uh, and I I don't I was said confused. I don't know. Like, I didn't know. I I didn't know which I was. Uh, if you come in and you say, I, I, I'm just, just hearing about these things, I don't know which I am, one, that's okay. This is not, Jesus is not going to stop you on the way in and say, well, which one were you? Uh, that again, they, there is a base agreement. Jesus has been crucified, raised, and bur- or buried and raised. Salvation comes to him, through him. Jesus is coming back. It's real, right? It's not simply a spiritual coming, that he will come back, and that we will be with him for all eternity. Now, again, how those things happen 
and where Revelation 20 fits in there, they all have different viewpoints. Uh, it's okay. It's a good thing and a right thing for you to think about it, to read the scriptures, to study them, uh, to, and to say, hey, I, I, I think I land here, or I think I land here, and, and to study these things and to think about them. It's not worth fighting over. It's not, not the sort of thing we want to fight with people over. Uh, they're all biblical. They're all within orthodoxy. But it is helpful for you to think about, how do I view the scriptures? How do I see what Jesus is telling me? How, how, do, I put these pieces, uh, how do I put these pieces together uh, with the ultimate goal that you would put your faith in Jesus? One of the things I think gets missed when we talk about apocalyptic literature, we talk about the end times, I think this is true of Revelation. I think this is true of the prophets. I think this is true of 1 Thessalonians 4. I think this is nearly every place where you find apocalyptic literature, where you find predictions and prophecies of the end times. Almost always, it is in the context of comfort for believers or encouragement for believers or helping, uh, in calling them to hold firm and to, to conquer until the end, that if your understanding of the end times causes you to fight with unbelievers, I would argue regardless of which one you landed on, you're on the wrong one. That your understanding of the end times is meant to, I think, biblically to give you great hope and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, whatever you think of 1 Thessalonians 4, all four of these understand that, and we will be caught up to meet him in the air. All four of these understand that slightly differently. If you go to 1 Thessalonians 4, why is Paul talking about it at all? Because believers are beginning to die. And they're wondering, well, has Jesus not come back yet? Did, did we miss it? Has something happened? Right? Did, was it only a spiritual resurrection? Or are these people dead? And what, what's that whole discussion in 1 Thessalonians about? It's about Paul saying, take heart. Jesus is coming back for you. That's the whole reason he gives those specifics that he does is to help them to put their hope and trust in Jesus that death is not the end for them, that Christ is going to come for them. That our views of the end times should, one, be held humbly, right? They should be held with an open hand. I think I told you last night, or last week, Stan, uh, if the Lord takes me out of here before the tribulation, I won't complain, right? I'm not going to say, like, take me back. Uh, I don't want to eat crow. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to be wrong about that. We, we hold these things with an open hand. Uh, we hold them humbly, uh, but we, we should hold them in a way that leads us to a longing for Jesus. Again, we've, we've read this several times in this book. How does Revelation end? Come, Lord Jesus. Whatever, wherever you land, the greatest thing we ought to feel in this is, Lord, won't you come? Would, would, you, would you come in my life? Would, would you come and bring an end to all things? Would you come and that I might be with you? That it should create in us a great longing uh, to, to love and to follow and to en endure in Jesus. Uh, so these are, the, these are the four big buckets. Again, there's a, a ton more. I have done a great disservice to all four of these views uh, by trying to represent them in this way uh, this quickly. Uh, and I've tried to represent them honestly. Uh, and again, they're all, all reasonable, all, can have, all have a biblical case. Uh, obviously, wherever you land, you'll find that yours, you think, has a better biblical case than the others. Uh, all, have, uh, all have threads throughout church history. You can find, I, I think, pieces of all these throughout church history. Again, historic pre-mill, we see all the way going back. Uh, Puritans were, uh, were post-mill. Most Puritans were, were, were post-millennial. Uh, again, if you study Puritans, you, you study the way they ordered their societies. It makes, makes total sense, right? You, you see that post-mill uh, theology coming out and the way they ordered their lives and their societies. Uh, you, you, historic uh, dispensational pre-mill. Uh, again, comes to popularity, I think, through Darby and others. Um, but I, I think is you, you see pieces of that. You see understandings that are, are part of that throughout church history as well, uh, even all mill. So uh, I'm going to quit there uh, while I'm not too far behind, and then we'll, we'll, uh, we'll pick up and, and finish some other things as we try to bring all of these threads uh, through the last nine weeks to bring them all together in the next three weeks and, and to tie this off uh, in a nice bow. Let me, uh, let me pray for us, and we'll be done. Father, we thank you for your, your goodness, for your grace. We thank you for the hope of your return. Uh, Father, we pray you'd give us wisdom as we read your word. Give us a desire to search your word, to know what you have told us, that we would be faithful. Uh, Father, we pray you'd help us to endure, to hold fast uh, as we wait on you. Uh, Father, we thank you for the way the gospel has reached us, uh, that we have heard the good news of Jesus, that we could believe and be saved. And we, we pray, as you teach us to pray, that even today, as we study your word, that we might pray, Lord Jesus, come quickly. You might come for us. You might redeem us. You might bring us to yourself, that we might be with you for all eternity. We pray as we come to service. 
that you might use everything we do to grow that in us, that as we sing, as we pray, as we read your word, uh, that we would have eyes to see and ears to hear, that we, we would be reminded of the great grace that is ours in Christ, and that we would be reminded of the, the only hope that we have in this world is you, and that we would be emboldened to hold fast to you and to de- declare your goodness and your grace and your mercy um, to a lost world, that they may find their hope in, in you. Father, we thank you for this time you've given us, and we ask that you might be glorified in everything we say and do. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.